So a single member LLC is an entity structure that you can adopt um, with the aid of, with the assistance of an attorney or uh, through the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions website. Essentially kind of gives you the ability to operate as a sole proprietor, but then be afforded some liability protection. Um, and so from a, from a tax aspect, sole proprietorships and single member LLCs are one and the same unless as a single member LLC you decide to um, elect to be treated as a corporation or an S-corp. Um, but circling back to the sole proprietorship, again, advantages, easy setup. There's no separate tax return. It's a tax form that goes on your personal tax return. So it does reduce some of the tax administrative costs of preparing a separate tax return. Also, there's no need for a double enter set of a uh, set of books. We essentially just report revenues and expenses on your returns. There's no balance sheet, so it eliminates the complexity of a double enter set of books. It also does provide some benefit when you are um, employ your children. If you have children working in your business as a sole proprietorship, if they're under age 18, there's no FICA or Medicare taxes that you have to pay on those wages. So that's a 15% tax savings for the business. You can also implement what we call medical reimbursement plans. Usually, if you have a sole proprietorship and you employ your spouse and put them on the payroll, you can implement a medical reimbursement plan that would essentially allow you to reimburse your employee, who is your spouse, for much, if not all, of your out-of-pocket expenses. That works in a scenario where you just have you and your spouse working in the business or maybe another family member. If you have a third party working in the business as well as an employee, you have to extend those benefits to uh, those employees as well. And um, like I said at the bottom of there, it does provide some limited liability protection. Some of the disadvantages though, with extremely profitable sole proprietorships, you're subject to FICA and Medicare on all of the profits that the the entity um, earns, whereas with a corporate structure, you may be able to defray or reduce some of that FICA and Medicare cost. Um, again, the disadvantage of a sole proprietorship without a single member LLC, you have liability exposure, as Tom had talked about. And with sole proprietorships, there is some limited um, ability to shift income to whether it's other generations or other family members, and you have the limited ability in terms of uh, fringe benefits, access to you know, retirement plans, disability insurance, cafeteria plans, stuff like that that come with corporations. And there's also the limited ability to pay capital gain rates on the eventual sale of a business that a lot of times is afforded to a corporate structure. And they're harder to sell. If you have an operating business um, that's being operated as a sole proprietorship, buyers um, are less willing to, um, to, to buy these types of businesses without a formal corporate structure of some sort. And so again, it just, it's just one of the disadvantages of operating as a sole proprietorship. And so I've kind of covered all the bullet points on this slide here. Any other items you'd like just to one, add? Just one thought with respect to just the decision about what form of business entity you're going to use to operate your business. You know, Sean talked about, you know, some of the, it's harder to sell on the back end. Uh, there's limited capital gain uh, when you've got a sole, sole proprietorship. You need to keep in mind that the decisions you make when you're starting up your business about the form of the business is going to take are going to have implications down the road for the rest of the time that you operate that business. I talked a little bit about, uh, uh, when I was talking about the partnerships, about the ability to convert from one type of business entity to another. So you convert from doing a sole proprietorship, and at some point in time you decide, well, I'm going to be a limited liability company. Or at some point in time you decide, well, now it's not just going to be me, I'm going to bring somebody else in, and I'm going to have a partnership. 
or uh, you decide again uh, it's yourself and you need you need more capital and and so you decide you're going to have uh, uh, potentially uh, some outside investors or some other people that are going to go in business with you uh, you may form a corporation so uh, but the type of entity that you have has uh, you know it's much simpler it's as easy as possible to to have a sole proprietorship but there are consequences to choosing that form of uh, business formation, non-formation essentially, uh, down the road on the back end. And so you just need to keep in mind that uh, those decisions do have impact and you want to think through that uh, decision-making process on the front end instead of being on the back end and having these assets and not able to uh, either find, you know, put them together such that you've got this separate business entity that you can sell. Sole proprietor, one of the things in a business is to make the business more valuable, you try to get that the main person that maybe started the business, you know, he delegates some of the responsibilities for management, for the accounting, for marketing, for just the day-to-day -day operations of the business. When he goes to sell that business, if he's delegated that and can step back, he or she is, can step back from the business, that business has real value because I, as a buyer, to come in to buy that business, I don't have to jump in and work there, you know, 60 hours a week to make that value you know, make that business continue to go. If those responsibilities have been delegated to a management team, then the business can con continue on without my uh, input, my participation, which creates more value and makes the business more valuable on the back end when you go to sell it. So I think those are some of the considerations that we're talking about these various different business entities, but the thought is you need to uh, consider the type that you choose to begin with because it's going to have implications for you uh, down the road as things go on. All right. I'd like to say one last thing. I guess as far as my opinion regarding sole proprietorships, I recommend them in situations one, it's usually a single person and the business is them, like a real estate agent or somebody like that. But when you have a business that you're going to employ many people, anywhere from you know more than a couple people, um, or you're building out a business that you're eventually going to sell because the business isn't you, it's something that you're building, we normally recommend you go with a different owner type, ownership structure, whether it's a partnership or uh, a corporate structure of some sort. Partnerships. On the topic of, um, I guess, what do you want? Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, so my take on the partnerships is, one, you've got the general partnership like Tom talked about earlier, or you have multi-member LLCs or multi-member LLPs that have elected to be treated as partnerships for tax purposes. And so the benefits of partnerships, I'm sorry, the benefits of LLCs or limited liability entities is pretty straightforward, a mechanism to reduce your exposure to outside liability. With regard to general partnerships, you lack that ability to limit uh, liabilities. Focusing on the tax aspects of it, of a partnership or a LLC operating as a partnership, um, again, there's no FICA or Medicare taxes on wages for children that operate or work in the business who are under age 18. With partnerships, there's ultimate flexibility into allocating income, losses, deductions between the individual partners in the business, whether they're working partners or investment partners. And so there is a lot of flexibility there. However, at the end of the day, you've got a lot of latitude with the flexibility, but you can't take it too far to the point that your special allocations get out of the realm of economic reality. And so the IRS does look at entities that have some, we'll call them avant-garde special allocations, in an effort to understand the allocations and the motives and to the extent that they may not represent economic reality, they may challenge them. One of the benefits of a partnership, there's no limit on owner, ownership count. 
you can have as many partners in a partnership as you want that gives you ultimate flexibility. Let's talk about tax basis. Usually businesses that start out will incur losses in the early years, or if you have a capital intensive business, you have opportunities to claim large amounts of depreciation, which a lot of times will reduce your profit sometimes or many times below zero, even though your cash flow might not be below zero. Under that scenario, you have the ability to deduct those losses, but generally the IRS says, we'll let you deduct losses to the extent that you have skin in the game, cash that you've put in the business. Whereas if you've gone to the bank and financed equipment or financed operations that have generated losses, because you're personally liable for those debts, you're able to deduct those losses as they're incurred, even though the losses exceed the actual cash you've put into the partnership. Whereas you're going to find with an S corporation structure, that's different. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Tax-free distributions of appreciated assets. With the partnership, um, a lot of times, not a lot of times, in situations where you need to pull an asset out of a partnership and maybe give it to somebody, give it to a partner who's leaving because you don't have cash in the business, you only have an asset in the business, those assets can usually come out tax-free even though they're appreciated in value or maybe because they've been depreciated to zero so on the books, they have zero value, but for fair market value purposes, they have some value. That, again, gives you ultimate flexibility for allowing a partner to possibly leave. With an S corporation or a corporate situation, um, there may be a tax situation that's involved in distributing an asset, whereas with a partnership, there is not. Um, Tax-free cash distributions. Distributions can come out to the partners tax-free to the extent that they have basis in the partnership, i.e. through prior cash infusions or through prior earnings that were retained in the business or to the extent that you are personally liable for the obligations of the partnership. Sean, if I can just interrupt there for a second. Okay. So one of the things that I found in dealing with clients that have partnerships or form a partnership or going into it for the first time is the concept that income and cash are not the same thing. They think, well, I have uh, you know twenty thousand dollars worth of income in this partnership this year. I should have twenty thousand dollars of cash here in the bank that I can take and distribute. And that just those two things are not equal. And it's a lot of times it's hard to kind of equate or get that concept through because and the other the flip side of that is is that I have twenty thousand dollars of income and I'm paying taxes but I didn't get any money I didn't get any cash so can you just talk a little bit more about that idea and the, the, the issue with respect to that well in most cases you know the profit and loss reported by a partnership or even an entity um, it's 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 paper profit essentially in situations where you're not a cash basis taxpayer. With a cash basis taxpayer, you report your income when you receive it. You report your deductions when you pay it. And usually to the extent that you have profit or loss, that net profit will increase your cash or a loss will reduce your cash. However, there's another method of accounting. It's called accrual basis accounting. Um, which is required in most cases for companies or entities that own inventory. Under that scenario, you report your income when you bill your customer or you deliver the services or the products to them, even though they may not pay you for 60, 90 days. Same holds true for expenses. You incur a deductible expense and report it when your vendor delivers the product or the services to you, even though, again, you may not pay them for 30, 60, 90 days, okay? And so under the accrual base of accounting, that provides a disconnect to the cash because that profit and loss under that scenario doesn't 
equate to cash in the bank. Also what throws a wrench in the gears uh, regarding the um, how much cash you have in the bank compared to what you have in profits is when you go out and buy a big piece of equipment and you finance that equipment over many years. Well, you depreciate that asset maybe in the first year with the Section 179 like Tammy talked about, but you're going to pay that loan off over maybe five years. Well, that's going to deplete your cash in years two, three, four, and five, and so you will find that you may have a lot of profits in those years, but no cash. Again, the cash went to satisfy the obligations on the debt service. And again, it's, it's something that is sometimes hard to get your, um, wrap your arms around. All right, well, let's talk about disadvantages. <clears throat> the cost of setup and annual filings. You know, um, with regard to, you know, a general partnership, as Tom talked about, people can just mutually agree to operate as a partnership. But in most cases, as, most cases, I recommend the best practice is to operate as maybe a, a limited liability entity of some sort, which usually requires a formalized filing with the state, um, usually requires the assistance from an attorney, and will involve um, such fees. There's also usually an annual filing of a separate corporate or partnership tax return. Again, it just adds to the administrative cost of um, operating the business. All of the income that's earned in a partnership or reported on a partnership return is subject to Social Security tax and Medicare, even for those non-working partners. And so, again, that may be a big surprise if you're a non-working partner. You have limited access to fringe benefits, especially if you're a working partner. You're not afforded um, access to all of the benefit plans as an employee does working for a corporation such that partnerships limit your abilities to tax-free fringes like health insurance, health savings accounts, disability insurance, cafeteria plans for daycare, medical room plans, and even retirement plans. And so we find that those fringes are more readily available under a corporate type structure. Taxation at, um, at formation. Sometimes when you file, or I'm sorry, when you form a partnership and you contribute assets, or you agree to contribute services to the partnership in exchange for your partnership, there's a tax event, even though no cash may have changed hands especially in a situation if you have, say, for instance, a, a big combine or a big piece of machinery that you bought as a sole proprietor and that you're going to contribute that piece of machinery to the partnership. And, oh, by the way, there's still three years left on the mortgage. So the, the machinery may have positive value. It may have a $200,000 loan associated with it. The minute you contribute that machinery to the partnership in exchange for a partnership interest, you ha potentially could have a taxable event. So in situations where you're forming a partnership, where you're putting in more than just cash, where you're contributing equipment that may be subject to loans, or where you're going to provide services in the future, um, we recommend that you talk to a tax advisor to give you some guidance about the taxation aspect of forming the partnership. And on termination of, or transfer of partnership interests, if we have a partner that is departing and he's going to sell his partnership interest to a new person, a new partner that's coming in, one of the downsides of operating a business under a partnership structure is what we call hot assets. That's where you've got depreciation recapture as a result of a transfer in a partnership interest. You could potentially have no cash exchanging hands. You're just essentially taking a partnership interest and giving it to or selling it to another partner or incoming partner, which could trigger 
in many cases is a large gain. Or if you're a cash basis partnership and you've got uncollected monies from your customers at the day you transfer your interest, those become taxable on that day. So again, with partnership transfers, there are a lot of times surprises. And so again, we recommend that you work with the professionals to kind of address the tax implications of any changes that may be uh, associated with the transfer or termination of an interest. And so something we see in many cases with regard to a partnership, if you have an exchange of more than 50% of an interest in a partnership, you have what we call a technical termination. And if you don't plan for that proper, properly, it can result in significant negative tax consequences. And again, the benefits of good counsel will help you kind of steer through those um, landmines. A couple of items. So let's say I've got a, I've got a partnership, uh, two partners. Uh, we've got three employees in that partnership. They're operating a business. And so uh, just explain to me a little bit the difference between those three people that are working uh, who are getting paid every two weeks uh, and they're getting uh, paid wages and the partners who are also working in the partnership and their pay that they're taking every two weeks and just the difference between that for the partner as opposed to the non-partners who are working in the business. Okay, so as a partner in the partnership, you can't be an employee. Um, you can't go on payroll. So how do you get compensated? Well, partnership law provides for what they call guaranteed payments. It's essentially a distribution to you out of the partnership checkbook without it being processed as payroll. And so these guaranteed payments are reported on a personal tax return on a different line than what your wages are paid on. And they are subject to income tax, federal, state, social security tax as well. And so that's your mechanism for getting compensated as a working partner in a partnership. For a non-working partner in a partnership, really the only way to compensate that person is th through distributions um, of profits to them. So if I have a, if I'm getting a guaranteed payment every two weeks, mm -hmm. once a month or whatever, is that guaranteed payment deducted from the income of the partnership? Yeah, it's, it's the equivalent of wages in the partnership. And the guaranteed payment structure allows you to try and true up the compensation for a person's efforts who's actually working in the partnership. And so if you've got somebody that's working half time in a partnership, you may give them $1,000 every month as a guaranteed payment or the equivalent of a wage, whereas you may have somebody who's working 40, 60 hours a week in the partnership, they may take a higher guaranteed payment to compensate them for their personal services. And on the other hand, if I'm one of the two partners, you're the one that's working the 60 hours a week, I'm going and golfing, mm -hmm. uh, I get a distribution and so uh, I may get that once a month, I may get that twice a year, I may get that once a year. Is that distribution, is that cash that I'm getting, is that deducted from the partnership income? It is not. It's essentially it's a return of your investment or it's considered a return of previously taxed profits. And so one of the items regarding partnership distributions is that we always recommend that if you're going to pay distributions that you pay them um, pro rata based on the ownership percentage um, of the partners. It just alleviates problems down the road when you wind up a partnership because in a situation where a partner may have done a special distribution and you find yourself in a situation where you've taken out more cash from the partnership than the equivalent skin that you have in the game, you may end up with a significant tax bill at the end of the day. You know, one of the things I think 
that people generally think and that uh, when you look at a partnership, you say, well, that's pretty simple, okay? Uh, don't have any fi filing requirements with the state. You know, I'm going to do this, you know, hire up the accountant to do the tax return. Uh, everything's just going to pass through that. I end up on mine. But uh, when you start to talk about, uh, you know, guaranteed payments or distributions or wages, or then you talk about uh, you know the special allocations between partners for various as to how they're going to share in the profits and losses. In my mind, uh, from a from the legal side of it, uh, you know once you get the op or the the partnership agreement put together and you've you've fleshed that out and you've dealt with if you're going to have any of these special allocations, that's pretty pretty straightforward. But at least from my perspective, and uh, Sean does the tax returns for. Uh, uh, for me individually, but also for some building partnerships that we're involved in those building partnerships and when you start having people come in and come out and and uh, deal with these allocations uh, In my mind anyway, what appears at least from the legal side I think more straightforward and not particularly complicated. I find that the partnership uh, taxation issues the basis your capital accounts bringing people in and out are far, far more complex than if you have a corporation which from a legal side has specific requirements. You've got to do these, you've got to file these things with the state, you've got to uh, have your annual meeting, you've got to have a board of directors, you've got to have elections, you've got to have minutes. You think, man, that is, that, you know, you know, that's part of the reason that limited liability companies came into play is because people wanted to get away from all that formality. But in my view, from from the legal side of it, that may seem more complex and more uh, a lot of rules that you have to comply with. But when you get to the tax side, tax side of it on the corporate thing, then you're pretty straightforward. I mean, corporations have been around forever. You know, you've got these separate, uh, uh, you know, you've got this rules, they're gonna get taxed and boom, that's it, you know, and you're done. And so um, I just wanted to comment on that, you know, from a legal side, the partnerships may look pretty uh, simple and straightforward. I find the tax aspect of partnerships and partnership agreements and dealing with that and the capital accounts and your basis and the fact that you didn't put any money in but you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars you put that in and you get credit for that uh, just because you've guaranteed it as a partner I, I find those things much more complex than I do on the side for the corporate corporate things and consequently uh, you know the last point on the advantages side that Sean had that it's a good vehicle for real estate it's compl in my mind it's complicated enough when you get, you know, especially when you're moving partners in and out of a, of a partnership, it's complicated enough with the, for real estate, uh, which is really a passive, passive uh, business. I mean, you're collecting rents and you know that type of thing. But uh, uh, it's complicated enough there to, that if you're going to have an operating entity, as I think you said, Sean, and you're going to have more than just you know, a couple of people that are involved in it, uh, in a business that's actually an operating business, I'm much more inclined to lean towards the, you know, the, uh, the corporate structure, or the limited liability company structure, as opposed to a uh, partnership. On the other hand, for, uh, I've got a lot of clients who have the operating entity and a real estate entity, and generally those real estate entities are a partnership or a limited liability company taxed as a par partnership or a limited liability partnership. So. Yeah, I mean, the accounting aspect of operating a partnership, especially if you add another generation or if you've got people that come and go, um, can cause a lot of brain damage with regard to <laughs> tracking the accounting. Um, it's a great vehicle for real estate just because real estate does not fit well with a C corporation or a corporate environment because it can be trapped in there with um, built-in gains, okay? And so best practices for recommendations keep the real estate in a limited liability entity of some sort the business operations usually is best housed in some sort of corporate structure whether it's a C corp or an S corp because it does provide significant advantages especially when it comes to the operations and the benefits the fringe benefits that are available to owners and non owners alike all right, well, let's talk about C corporations. Do you want to chat about liability or no? Well, the, the big issue with, uh, you know, corporations have been around forever. Uh, the, the entity concept was originated with uh, corporations. It's a separate, it's a separate uh, entity under the law. It can sue. It can be sued. 
uh, it stands on its own, its own two feet. Uh, it has uh, a board of directors that manages it. It has the individual uh, shareholders who have ownership interests in it. They elect the board of directors. The board of directors elects the uh, officers to run the day-to-day -day operations. And uh, uh, as I said just a moment ago, there's a lot of rules about uh, you know what you have to file with the state to get the entity up and uh, operating. The fact that you have to have uh, annual uh, meetings, that you have to elect the officers and directors. A lot of formality around that, uh, and the the risk is is that if you don't comply with that formality and you haven't kept your uh, books up to date and you don't go through the process of having an annual meeting and electing your directors and dealing with third parties as as the corporate entity as opposed to you individually, there's the risk that you spent all that money and effort and filed all those uh, all the paperwork and you don't get the protection of the liability. You don't get that liability protection if you haven't abided by the rules of the game. And so one of the key elements is to get that protection. Uh, it's you know from a from a legal standpoint as I said, corporations have been around forever. The law with respect to disputes among shareholders, uh, the law with respect to what you can, you know, if I sue uh, uh, the ABC Corporation, I get the assets of that entity, but I don't get the assets of the individual shareholders. In a big, in the publicly traded arena, if you own stock in 3M and there's a lawsuit against 3M, you know, you're not at risk as a shareholder. That same thing applies that if I've got a farming corporation and there's a claim against that corporation, then the claim's going to go against the corporate asset. It's not going to go against your individual assets. That's where it becomes important about whether those assets are diversified or whether you have them all in one pot in the, in the operating entity or whether you have the operating entity with some of the assets and then you've got the other assets that, uh, you know, the real estate and stuff in a different uh, entity so that if there is that claim and there is that liability, you've got that protection to con contain that uh, claim within the, uh, within the corporate entity and not expose it to the other asset. Having said that, you still need to have insurance. You still have to have your general liability insurance uh, to protect with respect to that. And, and a corporation that is underfunded, uh, and then the, you expect to get that liability protection. There's some case law that, you know, they can pierce the corporate veil in that case because you've underfunded it with capital, so. All right, thanks. Well, I think regarding the annual um, filings and stuff like that, you know, it's no different than doing tax returns. We're all used to filing tax returns every year, whether it's a personal return, a corporate return, and so maintaining the corporate minutes and doing all the stuff as it relates to the Secretary of State and the attorneys with technology and automation it should just become an automatic process and i think it's become simpler over the years probably yes um, and so let's talk about c corporations so now we've convinced you or we've kind of talked about the benefits of uh of a corporation the biggest question now is c corp or s corp well let's start with c corporations so you know again no limit on shareholder count with a C corporation. You can have multiple classes of stock, again, that a lot of times will only apply in situations of very large corporations or in situations when the owners want to bring in maybe some lower level management to be owners in the business. They can usually accomplish their goals with uh, a different class of stock of some sort. Um, there's no shareholder tax in the retained income. With a C corporation, the corporation reports its own profits, it pays its own taxes. To the extent it doesn't pay those profits out to an individual or to the owners, those profits are not taxed at the individual level. C corporations are a good tax shelter for the right type of business because the first $100,000 of profits are taxed at very low rates. $50,000, the first 50 is taxed at 15%. From, from 50,000 to 75,000, it's taxed at 25%. And from 75 to 100, it's taxed at 34%. So again, it does provide a mechanism for building um, a pool of assets at very low tax rates and kind of can be the equivalent of a tax shelter. 
C corporations, if you created them within the last 15 years or so to the extent that you eventually sell them or sell the stock, there are some specific, um, there's a specific code section called section 1202 that allows you to essentially cut the capital gains tax in half or in some cases to zero. Again, it's an opportunity that's afforded to C corporations. 1244 stock loss situation. So a lot of times, business entities will incur losses in the early years. And to the extent that a business can't get up and running and become a profitable venture, uh, when it comes time to decide, all right, we're gonna shut this thing down, it's not a viable business, um, there's a code section 1244 that allows an owner, a single owner, to deduct the first 50000 of their investment as an ordinary loss. For married taxpayers, it's 100 To the extent your losses exceed that, then it's considered capital losses, which essentially requires you to have capital gains to take or generate a benefit from those losses over and above that. You have a full suite of French benefits that are normally afforded to corporations. A lot of health benefits, health savings accounts, disabilities, fringe benefit plans for daycare, medical reimbursement plans, retirement plans. The C Corporation is a great vehicle to maximize the benefits of um, working employees. And as a shareholder in a corporation, there's only two ways to get money out of a corporation, C Corporation. Wages or dividends. And so as wages, you're an employee and you have access to fringe benefit plans. One of the other benefits of a corporation is the tax-free formation. Like we talked about with partnerships, you can have a taxable event on formation. With, with the C corporation, a corporate tax structure, in many cases there's not going to be unforeseen taxes at formation. The filing of a single tax return if you have multiple businesses. And so if you have multiple businesses, you could create a parent, you can have a pool of subs underneath, and they all roll up into one tax return as a consolidated tax return. Again, in an effort to reduce the cost of compliance with the tax laws, the consolidated tax return can be a benefit. And in Wisconsin, to the extent if you sell a corporation to a family member, there's a 100% exemption on the gain on the sale of that stock to a family member, qualified family member. So again, a benefit to having a corporation in Wisconsin. Let's talk about disadvantages. Again, cost of setup, annual filings. Again, like a partnership, it requires a double interest set of books. It requires a separate tax return. Distributions are taxed as dividends, like we talked about. Two ways to get money out of a C corp. Dividends, wages. Although dividends do come at a lower tax rate than wages do. However, when you take dividends out of a corporation, they've already been taxed at the corporate level, so you still have the impact of double taxation on that stream of income. Distributions of property may result in corporate tax. So if you have a, a shareholder that needs to leave, wants to leave, you want to get that person out of here, and you've entered into an agreement, but you've got no cash. All you can do is give them that piece of equipment. In a situation where you distribute an asset, a lot of times there may come a tax bill with distributing that asset. So again, in situations where that might be not taking a shareholder out, it's best to work with the advisors to understand the tax impl implications. Double taxation on the sale of assets. I've got an example at the very end that will kind of um, showcase the impact of double taxation. So we'll talk about that when we get to a later slide. Capital gains are taxed at ordinary rates. And so, for instance, if you've got a corporate tax return or a corporate tax structure that may have real estate, if you sell that real estate and incur a gain at the corporate level, it's ordinary income, it's taxed, it could be taxed at the highest rate, which could be nearly 50%. 
whereas if that real estate was owned as an individual or owned through a partnership or even owned in an S corporation, the capital gain character retains, is retained and is taxed on the individual's return at 15, 20% for federal purposes and as low as 3 or 4% for state. So again, a benefit to having the real estate in a pass-through entity. Net operating losses do not benefit shareholders. So again, in the early years or startup years of a corporation, a lot of times you will incur losses. To the extent there are losses, they go nowhere. They become suspended and they get carried forward and, get, and are used to offset future profits. And so if you have a business that would not result or generate future profits, those NOL could just evaporate into thin air. Whereas with an S corporation or a pass-through entity like a partnership, those losses flow into the personal return and can and in many cases will be utilized by the owners and would eliminate the possibility of them evaporating without any benefit. There's two other types of taxes, accumulated earnings tax and personal holding company tax. In situations where businesses have been very successful and um, there are abuses in the area of retaining significant amounts of profits in these businesses over many, many years, the IRS in some cases will come in and um, incur or assess an additional tax called the accumulated earnings tax or personal holding company tax. We find that we can, we can navigate away from these situations, usually by converting these entities into um, S corporations. And so again, it's, just, it's something that's remote, but it's there. Um, another disadvantage, again, FICA Medicare taxes on wages. Like I talked about, there's only two ways to get money out of a C-Corp, distributions, dividends, wages. And so if you are working for the business and you know the services that you provide you know equate to you know a two hundred thousand dollar salary but if you've got a very profitable business then your only way to get the profits out of that business into your pocket are through salary and you take eight hundred thousand dollars in salary which is probably excessive for the services that you're performing you're still going to incur the FICA and Medicare taxes on the wages that issue goes away with an S corporation Personal service corporation. So if you're a personal service corp, that's a, a CPA firm, a law firm, dental practice, engineers. Practicing as C corporations, if you leave profits in the business, it's taxed at the highest tax rate, 35%. And so you'll find that most personal service corporations will be operating as S corporations, or if they do operate as C corporations, they zero the income out each year and pay the, pay the wages out to the shareholders. And if you sell your C corporation stock or assets to a third party and convert everything to cash, and if it's a large enough number, you'll pay an additional 3.8% Obamacare tax on top of the capital gains taxes that you pay. Again, a disadvantage for operating as a C corporation. Let's move on. Let's move on to the S. Okay. All right. So, did you want to chat? Go ahead. Okay. Um, S corporations. You know, S corporations are probably the most favorable or most popular entity uh, to operate as for tax purposes. Again, you're afforded the the, the tax benefits of what we talked about, Section 1202, reduced capital gains, and the 1244 stock loss. Tax free forma formation, you eliminate the double taxation. We'll see that um, benefit on the next slide. There's a FICA and Medicare tax savings on wages. And so to get money out of an S corporation, you've got, again, you've got two ways to do it. Take wages or take distributions. However, your distributions are not taxable to you to the extent that you're being returned profits that you were previously taxed on. Okay, with an S corporation, 
The S Corporation reports the profits, the losses. It does not pay any taxes. The profits flow through to the owner's personal tax returns on a piece of paper called the K-1. That income is reported on your tax return whether you take the cash out or not. In most cases, businesses will continue to build equity to finance the growth of their operations and will usually just distribute enough tax or enough, enough distributions to cover the tax liabilities. Okay? And so what does this do for us? Well, this allows us to take reduced salaries. Now I don't need to take $800,000 to get the salary I want. If I've got a very profitable business, I could take $100,000 in salary, which we always recommend to say try to maintain a market-based salary. And then to the extent you have profits that exceed that and you need those or want those monies, you can take them as um, distributions, which sidesteps or avoids the Social Security tax. However, the downside to that is with regard to retirement plans, a lot of times they're tied to wages. And so you may be in a situation where you want to maximize a retirement plan contribution, so you may have to take a higher salary than, say, $100,000. Capital gains and losses pass through at low, lower rates. We talked about that. Again, if you have a, an asset that's sold in a S corporation that has capital gain character to it, the, the, the capital gain flows through to your personal return. You're taxed at the lower rates. Income shifting. S Corporation is a great vehicle to bring family members or even management into the ownership fray by issuing shares of stock to them. Um, by doing that, you essentially shift the profits to them equal to their ownership percentage. It's a great mechanism to get um, to shift income to lower tax brackets and can be um, orchestrated with a, with a strategy to eventually work yourself out of the business and have management or family members or some other third party become an owner in the business. Single filing of consolidated tax returns. One of the biggest benefits I see with S corporations is entrepreneurs a lot of times will be ha own multiple businesses. Usually you'll have a very profitable business and you'll have some startups that are they're, they're sucking cash. They need cash. And so if you treat them as separate businesses for tax purposes, by transferring cash from the profitable business to the losing business, a lot of times comes with a tax bill. However, if you set up the proper structure where you have a parent S corporation and you have your individual operating businesses operate as, um, as children, I would say, of the S corporation or subsidiaries, the transfers of the cash between those individual businesses, that tax issue goes away. So it allows you to plan and operate startup businesses without incurring tax liabilities. Again, for Wisconsin purposes, the exemption tax related to selling the business to a family member. Again, a zero tax situation in many situations. No Obamacare tax to working owners as well. Now let's talk about disadvantages. We talked about cost of setup, same thing, double entry set of books. However, the shareholder count is limited to 100 shareholders. So very big companies that have more than 100 shareholders or need more than 100 shareholders may have to go back to becoming a C corporation. They restrict stock use, stock to single class of stock. Property distributions. Cash is easy to distribute. It comes out at fair market value. A dollar is worth a dollar. With regard to property, if you're going to distribute an asset to a shareholder, for instance, you want to distribute a car that is on the books or fully depreciated, the car comes out at fair market value. Even though it has no value for, for tax purposes, um, when it comes out, it could create a taxable event for the corporation. Again, a surprise a lot of times without seeking advice ahead of time. You are limited on your fringe benefits. There are certain fringe benefits that um, are reduced for working shareholders in an S corporation. Built-in gains and a conversion from a C to an S. So basically, many companies can operate as a C corporation for many years. If you decide that you like the look and feel of an S corporation or you're planning a transition 
out, say, five years from now, you want to sell this business, and you want to eliminate the double taxation that's going to come with the sale of this business, you can convert from a C corporation to an S corporation. However, during the five-year period after you elect S, if you sell an asset at a gain, you will incur a corporate-level tax as though you were still a C corporation. That issue goes away. That usually can be managed with proper planning. One of the other downfalls is no foreign shareholders, and you can only have qualified trusts be qualified shareholders in an S corporation. And so you can run into situations if you want to have um, a non-resident alien be a shareholder in an S corporation. Losses are limited to the basis. Again, if you have law, if your business incurs losses, you're only allowed to deduct those losses to the extent that you have skin in the game, money that you've put into the business yourself. If you've gone to the bank and opened up an operating line of credit in the name of the business, you can't use your personal guarantee on that operating line of credit to finance or to deduct your losses. In that, ca in that situation, you need to personally go to the bank, take the money out, or I'm sorry, take the loan out in your name, and then you advance the monies to the corporation so that you can deduct those losses. If not, they become suspended and will be deducted in, pro in future years when you have profits. And per share per day. With S corporations, profits have to be allocated based on your ownership. Like a partnership, it's however creative you want to get, you have much more flexibility. So. so we've talked about C corporations, we've now talked about S corporations. <clears throat> the, the big issue is, in, in my mind, is the double taxation. I think you've got the example, so let's just go mm -hmm. through the example okay. of the difference of having a C corporation or S corporation and you, you sell, sell the company. Okay. All right, so I just kind of put the slide together quickly here. So we talked about the eliminates the double taxation. Um, we talked a little bit about the bigs, the built-in gains tax. It's a flat tax rate at 35%. Um, and the other downfall is a lot of times we will recommend that the business get a valuation or possibly an appraisal in some situations. Again, it, re it all boils down to the planning. So let's look at a sales scenario as a C corporation or an S corporation. If, I got, if I've got a C corporation and I sell that business for $2 million. If I've got $1,500,000 worth of assets that I purchased over the years, and I've claimed $1,200,000 of the depreciation, my basis in those assets is $300,000. Under this scenario, the corporation is going to have a $1,700,000 gain. The corporate level tax is $666,000. So that leaves $1,333,000 in the bank to be distributed to the owners. When we take that million three and distribute it to John in this case, he's going to have a long term capital gain of $1,333,500. His tax at the personal level is going to be $379,000. So his net take home is $955,000. Had John been an S corporation and waited the five years, or had, I'm sorry, had John been a, had elected to be an S corporation and waited five years, or had been an S corporation from day one, the tax situation would have been entirely different. The taxable gain reported by the corporation would still be a million seven. However, there's no tax at the corporate level. So $2 million is available to John as a distribution. John's basis in his stock under this scenario is the $300,000 basis in the assets plus the original $500 that he funded the company with. His gain is nearly a million seven. His tax is $654,000. So his take home pay from this sale would be a million three hundred forty-six thousand dollars or a tax benefit of being an S corporation of nearly four hundred thousand dollars. 
So with proper planning, you can see that there are significant benefits to being an S corporation and why it is probably the most favorable tax structure for most operating businesses. And again, like Tom had said previously, usually there's real estate involved with operating businesses. We feel best practices is to maintain the real estate in some sort of LLC, LLP, or partnership arrangement, and the operations actually be operated as a corporation of some sort, whether you start out as a C and go to an S, or whether you start out as an S and stay an S. So, so just to follow up on what Sean said, the decision at the beginning of the day about what form of business entity you're going to be can have significant dollar impact at the end when you go to get out of the business. The, as he said, with respect to, you know, you think about farm real estate, and, you know, uh, I remember when I started practicing, it was in the mid-80s, and I think, you know, it was, uh, you know, $500,000, $700,000, $1,500 an acre, uh, maybe, and then it crashed and went down, and, uh, but now, you know, recently, farm prices have been up. It's gone down in the most recent times a little bit because of uh, the commodity prices, but, uh, you know, if you've been in farming for a long time and you've got that, that property, you know, uh, you can see the decision that was made early on, how to own it, is going to impact any possible sale of that on the back end. The good thing is uh, that you do have the opportunity, if you can plan again, looking forward, to make that conversion from a C Corp to an S Corp and, uh, you know, try to eliminate some of that, uh, that tax liability when it's all captured inside the C Corporation. So I want to thank Sean for uh, coming over here today. I want to thank all of you folks uh, for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again uh, next year, hopefully. Thanks a lot.